Hello, my friend, and welcome to Wisdom Trek. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, your guide to wisdom and creating a living legacy. Thank you for joining us for our five-day-per-week Wisdom and Legacy Building Podcast. We are broadcasting from our studios at the Big House in Marietta, Ohio, and this is day 958 of our trek and time for our Philosophy Friday series. Each Friday, we will ponder some of the basic truths and mysteries of life and how they can impact us in creating our living legacy. As we continue on this trek that we call life, sometimes we do have questions about life, so our Friday trek is a time where we can ask Gramps. Gramps will answer your questions that you would like to ask your dad or granddad, but for whatever reason, this is not possible. No matter how old we are, I know that all of us would like the opportunity to ask dad or Gramps questions about life in many areas. Today is the ninth episode in a series delving into what makes each of us respond differently to life situations and circumstances. Understanding ourselves and how others may interpret life through their own paradigm will allow us to interact with each other with more love and compassion. This empathy can be achieved by utilizing a profound tool called the Enneagram. If you have missed any of the past seven Friday series, I would recommend that you go back and listen to them and read the wisdom journals. As we review the tool that we refer to as an Enneagram, it is a circle of nine interconnected points, Ennea referring to nine, and Gram referring to a drawing. Check out today's or any prior week's wisdom journal for a representation of it. I have also included in today's wisdom journal a copy of The Enneagram at a Glance, which was compiled by Suzanne H. Eller. If you'd like a PDF copy, click on the link in today's Wisdom Journal located on our website at wisdom-trek.com. I would also recommend a book called The Road Back to You, written by Ian Morgan Cron and Suzanne Stabil. This is an excellent book about the Enneagram journey of to self-discovery from a Christian perspective. In the first seven episodes, we explored how the Enneagram works and then presented an overview of all nine personality types. Last week, we took a deep dive into type number one, which is referred to as the reformer or the perfectionist. This week, we will continue with type number two, the helper. And then next week, we will focus on type number three, which is the achiever. Since we are exploring the Enneagram in detail, I would also recommend that you go back and read the Wisdom Journal each Friday to see the diagrams presented each week. As helpful as the Enneagram is, Keep in mind, though, that it is only a tool and cannot replace nor usurp the precepts that are found in God's Word. All decisions and actions that we make in life must be in harmony with God's precepts. But the question for the next several months will be, Hey, Gramps, why do people act or react to situations and circumstances in life so differently? How can I gain wisdom and better understand myself and others so that I can love, serve, and minister to them on a deeper level? So today, let's jump into the Enneagram system, type number two, the helper. The Enneagram type number two. This person is the caring interpersonal type. They're generous, demonstrative, people-pleasing, and also possessive. So type two in brief. Twos are empathetic, sincere, and warm-hearted. They are friendly, generous, and self-sacrificing, but they can also be sentimental, flattering, and people-pleasing. They are well-meaning and driven to be close to others, but can slip into doing things for others in order to be needed. They typically have problems with possessiveness and with acknowledging their own needs. At their best, they're unselfish and altruistic, and they have unconditional love for others. The basic fears of type number two are of being unwanted or unworthy of being loved. Their basic desire is to feel loved. An Enneagram 2 with a one wing is the servant type. The Enneagram 2 with a three wing is the host or hostess. The key motivations for a type 2 are they want to be loved, to express their feelings to others, to be needed and appreciated, to get others to respond to them, to vindicate their claims about themselves. The meaning of the arrows for the Enneagram 2, when moving in the direction of disintegration or stress, Needy 2 suddenly become aggressive and dominating like unhealthy 8s. However, when moving in the direction of integration or growth, even the prideful and self-deceptive 2s become more self-nurturing and emotionally aware like healthy 4s. What is the overview for a type 2? We have named the personality of type 2 the helper 
because people of this type are either the most genuinely helpful to other people or when they are less healthy, they are the most highly invested in seeing themselves as helpful. Being generous and going out of their way for others makes two feels that theirs is the richest and most meaningful way to live. The love and concern that they feel and the genuine good that they do warms their hearts and makes them feel worthwhile. Twos are interested in what they feel to be really, really good things in life. Love, closeness, sharing, family, and friendships. Let's look at an example from a two. Louise is a minister who shares the joys that she finds in being a two. And this is what she says. I cannot imagine being another type. I would not want to be another type. I like being involved in people's lives. I like feeling compassionate, caring, and nurturing. I like cooking and homemaking. I like having the confidence that anyone can tell me anything about themselves and I will be able to love them. I am really proud of myself and love myself for being able to be with people where they really are. I really can and do love people, pets, and things. And I am a great cook. When twos are healthy and in balance, they are really loving, helpful, generous, and considerate. People are drawn to them like bees to honey. Healthy twos warms others in the glow of their hearts. They enliven others with appreciation and attention. Helping people to see positive qualities about themselves that they had not previously recognized. In short, healthy twos are the embodiment of a good parent that everyone wishes they had. Someone who sees them as they are, understands them with immense compassion, helps and encourages with infinite patience, and is always willing to lend a hand while knowing precisely how and when to let go. Healthy twos open their own hearts because they are already so open that they show us the way to be more deeply and richly human. And Louise continues her comment. All of my jobs revolve around helping people. I was a teacher who wanted to be sensitive to children and help them to get off to a good start. I was a religious education director in a number of parishes. I thought that if people learned about their spiritual life, they would be happier. The most important part of my life is my spiritual life. I was in a religious community for 10 years. I married a former priest, and we both have our spirituality as a basis for our life together. However, two's inner development may be limited by their shadow side, which is pride, self-deception, and the tendency to become overly involved in the lives of others, and the tendency to manipulate others to get their own emotional needs met. Transformational work for any of us entails going into dark places within ourselves, and this very much goes against the grain of a two's personality structure, which prefers to see itself in only the most positive and glowing terms. Perhaps the biggest obstacle facing twos, threes, and fours in their inner work is to having face their underlying center, the fear of worthlessness. Beneath the surface, all three types fear that they are without value in themselves, so they must be or do something extraordinary in order to win the love and acceptance of others. In the average to unhealthy levels, twos present a false image of being completely genuine and unselfish and of not wanting any kind of payoff for themselves when in fact, they can have enormous expectations of unacknowledged emotional needs. Average to unhealthy twos seek validation of their own worth by obeying their superego's demands to sacrifice themselves to others. They believe that they must always put others first and be loving and unselfish if they want to be loved. The problems that they run into with putting others first when they're average or unhealthy Two secretly have angry and resentful feelings that they work to repress and deny. Nevertheless, they eventually erupt in various ways, disrupting two's relationships and revealing the inauthenticity of many of the average or unhealthy twos that they make claims about themselves and the depth of their love. But in the healthy range, the picture is completely different. As an example, Don Rizzo, who much of the work that I am presenting comes from, puts it this way. My own maternal grandmother was an archetype, too. During World War II, she was mom to what seemed like half the Kessler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, by feeding the boys, allowing her home to be used as a home away from home, giving advice and consolation to anyone lonely and fearful about going to war. 
Although she and her husband were not wealthy and had two teenage sons of their own, she cooked extra meals for the servicemen, put them up for the night, and saw that their uniforms had all the buttons and were well pressed. She lived until she was in her 80s, and remembering those years as the happiest and most fulfilling of her life, probably because her healthy two capacities were so fully and richly engaged. So let's next look at the type 2's levels of development. And if you remember from the last couple of weeks, each of the types are broken into three major categories, the healthy, average, and unhealthy levels. And within each of those levels are three sub-levels. So let's start with level one, which is in the healthy category. And this is where our number two is at their best. They become deeply unselfish, humble, and altruistic, giving unconditional love to themselves and others. They feel it is a privilege to be in the lives of others. Moving to level two, they are empathetic, compassionate, and have feelings for others. They're caring and concerned about their needs. They're thoughtful, warm-hearted, forgiving, and sincere. As we move to level three under the healthy category, they are encouraging and appreciative, able to see the good in others. Service is important to them, but they take care of themselves also. They are nurturing, generous, and giving, a truly loving person. Let's move into the average category next, which starts with level four. An average two wants to be closer to others, so they start people-pleasing, becoming overly friendly, emotionally demonstrative, and full of good intentions about everything. They give seductive attention, approval, or strokes of flattery. Love is their supreme value, and they talk about it constantly. As we move to level five, they become overly intimate and intrusive. They need to be needed, so they hover, they meddle, and control in the name of love. They want others to depend on them. They give but expect something in return, so they're sending a double message. They are enveloping and possessive. The codependent, self-sacrificial person who cannot do enough for others end up wearing themselves out for everyone, creating needs for themselves to fulfill. Then as they move to level six within the average category, they become increasingly self-important and self-satisfied. They feel that they are indispensable, although they overrate their efforts on others' behalves. They tend to be a hypochondria, becoming a martyr for others. They become overbearing, patronizing, and presumptuous. And now let's move into the unhealthy category, starting with level seven. An unhealthy two can be manipulative and self-serving, instilling guilt by telling others how much they owe them and how others make them suffer. They abuse food and medication to stuff their feelings and to get sympathy. They undermine people making belittling and disparaging remarks. They are extremely self-deceptive about their motives and how aggressive and or selfish their behavior is. On level eight, they become domineering and coercive. They feel entitled to get anything they want from others. They want repayment from old debts, money, and sexual favors. And as they move to the lowest level, level nine, They're able to excuse and rationalize what they do since they feel abused and victimized by others and are bitterly resentful and angry. The summation of their aggressions result in chronic health problems as they vindicate themselves by falling apart and burdening others. This generally corresponds to a histronic personality disorder and fictitious disorders. Now let's move beyond the levels to personal growth recommendations for the Enneagram 2s. First and foremost, remember that if you are not addressing your own needs, it's highly unlikely that you'll be able to meet anyone else's needs without problems, underlying resentment, and continual frustration. Further, you will be less able to respond to people in a balanced way if you have not gotten adequate rest and taken care of yourself properly. It is not selfish to make sure that you're okay before attending to the needs of others. This is simply just common sense. Next, try to become more conscious of your own motives when you decide to help someone. While doing good things for people is certainly an admirable trait, when you do so because you expect the other person to appreciate you or do something nice in return, you are setting yourself up for disappointments. Your type is in real danger of falling into unconscious, codependent patterns with loved ones, and they almost will never bring you the results that you want. Next, while there are many things that you might do for other people, it is often better to ask them what they really need first. You are gifted as a two to accurately and by intuition feel the needs of others. 
but that does not necessarily mean that they want those needs remedied by you in the way that you have in mind. Communicate your intentions and be willing to accept no thank you. Someone deciding that they do not want your particular offer for help does not mean that they dislike you or are rejecting you. Next, resist the temptation to call attention to yourself or your good works. After you have done something for others, do not remind them about that. Let it be. Either they will remember your kindness themselves and thank you in their own way, or they will not. Your calling attention to what you have done for them only puts those people in a spot that makes them feel uneasy. It will not satisfy anyone or improve your relationships. And last, learn to recognize your affection and good wishes for others, even when these are not in the terms that you are familiar with. Although others may not express their feelings in the way that you want, they may be letting you know, in other ways, how much they care about you. If you can recognize what others are giving to you, you will rest more easily in the knowledge that you really are loved. Love is always available, but only to the degree that we are present and therefore receptive to it. That will conclude our focus on personality type 2, the helper. A word of encouragement for those of you that are Enneagram type 2s from God's word. Your heart for service must stem from a heart of love, both for yourself and for others. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And that will end our segment for today. Join us again next Friday as we explore further the Enneagram in our Ask Gramps episode. We will specifically explore in depth the Enneagram number three, The Achiever. The information that we will explore will allow you to unlock who you really are as we travel on this trek that we call life and we discover more about ourselves and others as we impact God's kingdom. I know that you'll find these insights interesting, practical, and profitable in living a rich and satisfying life. Our next trek is Meditation Monday, where we will help you to reflect on what is most important in life. So encourage your friends and family to join us and then come along with us on Monday for another day of Wisdom Trek creating a legacy. If you'd like to listen to any of the past 957 treks or read the associated journals, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts so that each day's trek will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor. But most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and then leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey and then create a great day every day. See you on Monday.